to come and yes. chime just be on speaker. Uh, good morning, Your Honor. Um, unfortunately, there happens to be an issue with our video. I want to make sure that I do come out on video. I'm going to, our, unfortunately, our technology person is not here. But if you would like to push our case second, then I can get that resolved. If not, I will have to appear um, without video. I suspect that I think the preference is just to do our cases as they uh, appear on our docket. I think people have prepared their morning accordingly, and I don't want to surprise anyone. So we will go ahead. Now, your case presents a little bit of a scheduling issue in that there is a I believe a cross claim on this matter. So have you all agreed how you'd like to divide your time or do you want to do it the standard way? Your Honor, I'm okay with the standard way. Mr. Widener? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Okay, so you do all of your presentation, then at one time the response and then your cross appeal, including your rebuttal? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you so much. That makes my job much uh, easier. And I appreciate it as a, uh, I don't have to worry about moving this uh, high-tech uh, counter to another location or, or a more skilled uh, user. With that, uh, Ms. Uh, Attorney Soler Passos, would you like to reserve any time for rebuttal? Yes, Your Honor, five minutes, please. Okay, I will do my best to uh, let you know when that happens. And uh, with that said, the court is ready to proceed. Attorney Soler Passos, you may proceed. All right. Good morning. May it please the court. Mr. Jackson appealed the trial court's order denying his motion to tax fees and costs. In the statement of the proceeding, the trial court stated it denied Mr. Jackson's fees and costs pursuant to Florida Statute 16210. 16210 provides that in action for foreclosure lien, the prevailing party is entitled to recover all costs, including a reasonable attorney's fee. There were two claims before the trial court. The first was the city's claim of foreclosure under 162.10, and the second was Mr. Jackson's counterclaim for specific performance of the settlement agreement. In regards to the foreclosure claim, litigation did not end when the parties entered into the settlement agreement, just the opposite. Mr. Jackson was forced to continue defending against the foreclosure action by filing an amended affirmative defense, amended answer, and affirmative defenses against the foreclosure in addition to a counterclaim for specific performance of settlement agreement. Had the city complied with the settlement agreement, the foreclosure action would have been dismissed or withdrawn and the parties would not be entitled to fee. And similarly, had the city filed a new case to pursue the foreclosure after dismissing or withdrawing the initial foreclosure action, either of the parties would be entitled to fees if they prevail. But the facts in this case are that the city continued to litigate the same initial claim of foreclosure after the parties entered into a settlement agreement and after the city repudiated that same agreement. After the repudiation, the two claims proceeded to a non-jury trial where the parties continued to dispute the facts both in support of the foreclosure claim and the counterclaim. And it was at the trial that the trial court heard, evaluated, and weighed the testimony of four live witnesses the sworn depositions of seven witnesses and over 70 exhibits. At the conclusion of the trial, the trial court found in favor of Mr. Jackson on both claims. On the first claim, the trial court held the city could not foreclose on its claims pursuant to 162.10. And on the second claim, the trial court ordered specific performance of the settlement agreement. Mr. Jackson was the prevailing party under the first claim and under 162.10, when the trial court ruled in his favor, prevented the city from foreclosing on the lien and ordered the city to take nothing from the action and go hence without day. As the prevailing party, Mr. Jackson is entitled to his attorney's fees and costs. And Mr. Jackson is only seeking to be made whole and reimbursed for the expense incurred in defending against the foreclosure action after the city repudiated the settlement agreement. Mr. Jackson asked this court to reverse the trial court's ruling denied his motion to tax fees and costs and remand the case back to the trial court to determine an award. Mr. Jackson further asked this court to affirm the trial court's decision in the final judgment as the trial court's findings of fact are cloaked with the presumption of correctness because the trial court was in the best position to evaluate and weigh the evidence at trial. 
and the findings of fact are supported by substantial evidence and the weight of the evidence. If the court has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I yield the remainder of my time, but for my rebuttal. Thank you, counsel. Are there any questions? I did not see any no. on my screen, so I'm making, I'm clearing the clock. So it starts off at zero for the next speaker and not with it already running. I have accomplished that. So uh, Mr. Widener, the, the floor is yours. It please the court, your honors, uh, opposing counsel. Um, I suppose I'm expected to address first this attorney fee issue and then get to the substantive uh, argument on the uh, main issue at appeal. Yes, counsel. Thank you. So the issue before the court is whether or not uh, Jackson is entitled to attorney's fees. As we plead, uh, Jackson is not entitled to attorney's fees because there was a settlement agreement that was reached as counsel uh, repeatedly refers to. We cite the case Kelly versus Bank United. There are a whole series of other cases that whenever something is compromised, um, settlement uh, waives the right to an attorney's fees. Uh, that's certainly what uh, occurred here based on the court's finding. Um, so in the briefs, the fact that there is no record, uh, no transcript of what happened there uh, regarding the attorney's fees. Of course, there's another uh, very real complication here, and that is the procedural um, mess, I'm frankly, that the case presents to the court, the case presents to the trial court. The court will note that um, the Jackson moved for attorney's fees prior to rendition of a final judgment. Uh, the sequence of it was there was a trial, there was a final judgment, we moved timely for rehearing. That rehearing was not disposed of at the point in time in which there was a hearing held on motion for attorney's fees. Um, the assertion that somehow the Jackson could be a prevailing party uh, and therefore entitled to attorney's fees just can't be supported by the record because there's no final judgment. Uh, and we uh, take the position that the, the denial of the attorney's fees uh, stands. Um, but then we have this complication of the main issue in appeal, and that is the final judgment uh, that we have to argue separately. Um, obviously, um, if the final- I'm sorry, when you say the main issue, I by main issue, you're equating your cross appeal to the main issue? Yes, sir, because okay. if that uh, is resolved in uh, St. Pete's favor and that final judgment reversed, then this issue of attorney's fees uh, likewise uh, comes backwards. I guess it becomes moot. Uh, it should be addressed by the court. But um, that's one of the very real complicating factors here is that you know they appealed first the attorney's fees that triggered our appeal of the underlying final judgment. So uh, with no transcript um, and with uh, the issue that the basis upon which they prevail uh, is a claim of settlement, we kind of dispute that uh, when in the uh, underlying appeal, there's applications, but that's something we'll get to. Um, then we have this issue of uh, the failure of Jackson to plead for attorney season answer. Uh, in their briefs and in ours, we deal with this uh, Stockman versus Downs issue about the fact that uh, when attorney's fees were not pled uh, in their answer, those are waived. So on those three bases, we claim that the uh, court was correct in denying attorney's fees, and we respect the request that the court uh, affirm that uh, and, I guess, address it in the uh, full appeal. Thank you, Your Honors. Are there any questions? There appear to be none. I will uh, clear the clock so that counsel uh, who doesn't have can visual. I, can I ask? Please, the, there's, there's a lot of time left. left. Real, yeah, no, no, I just want to make sure that Mr. Widener, I, I never heard any of your argument about what you called the main issue on appeal, the cross appeal. This is your presentation. Are, are, are you just resting on the brief? No, are we getting to that right now? It's your time, yes, sir, to use it all the way through. You said right, you, you have one block of time. Lines. Thank you, Judge Lucas. All right, let me get Thank to that. Thank you, Judge Lucas. The underlying appeal here is the city asks this court to reverse the final judgment that was entered in August 2021. Um, 
that final judgment, the amended final judgment, uh, directs the city to violate its own law, its own resolutions. And that's the central piece here that's missed uh, in the trial court. Uh, if you read the transcript, you'll see that the court, the trial court does this analysis like this is a business dispute, um, interpreting the contract and, and doing a contract analysis. What that uh, ignores is the issue that before the trial court is the law of the citizens. The city, Mr. Widener, the city has discretion through its code enforcement and through its various officers to enter into programs on, on these waivers or not enter them. It has the discretion whether even to enforce lean, lean actions or not enforce them. It has the discretion whether to enforce code enforcement or not enforce them. That's a, that's a classic discretionary call, which means that the city is free to bargain that or settle that as it sees fit in litigation. So why is sovereign immunity even, why are we talking about that here? Given, given the trial court's findings that, yeah, the, the city entered into agreement not to to, or to allow this this gentleman to enter into this this waiver program. Why are we talking about sovereign immunity here? The record on appeal includes the resolutions that Jackson placed into the record and that were before the court. Sovereign immunity is the issue because the court is impermissibly interfering in the legislative and the discretionary functions of government. How? How? If if the city has the discretionary ability to either do these lien waivers or not do them. And the court simply found, yeah, in this instance, you entered into this agreement. How is that an impermissive intrus intrusion into anything? It's just a recognition that the city exercised its discretionary power and settled this, this agreement. You may disagree with whether, whether or not there was sufficient evidence for that finding, but that's a categorically distinct and different argument than what you're raising, which is that, no, 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 the court could never find under any circumstances that the city had, had entered into a settlement agreement. 1993 of the record, we have the resolutions. There's three separate resolutions at council. The court will note that those resolutions are very specific. City uh, uh, council uh, signs and directs the mayor explicitly what to do included within this are the programs. And those uh, resolution and the programs can contain very specific directions. Critically, it's undisputed, but that the resolution and the applications require the application to be executed. One of the key things at trial was that it was not executed. Um, the $250 that's a requirement of the program was not paid. That's undisputed. It was handed back. What happens is the trial court uh, asks the city to ignore all of the procedural requirements that council had directed the mayor uh, to implement, specifically approval. If you look at the application for both revised lien waiver and special assessment, the court will note that there are very specific things that the city clerk signs off on, the city attorney signs off on. Those are checks and balances. Those are specific requirements that the city, uh, by legislation, by law, places into this program. And Mr. Weiner, is it, is it your position that your client's office misled the plaintiff in, or the, uh, the other side on this in terms of being able to settle this on the terms that were provided to him? No, sir. We dispute that the terms that were articulated were correct. One of the troubling things about the final judgment is it says that the court finds that the claims of Jackson were uncontroverted. But if you look at the uh, transcript, James Corbett, the POD, the person officially designated, says that, quote, no application was received. Uh, it's uncontroverted that the, the testimony... No application was received in what context? The fact that there was a notarization that was not provided at the time he showed up to the office? That's number one. Number okay, two. Well, let, let's deal with that one first. So Mr. Uh, Jackson presented testimony as to why he appeared with one document notarized and the other one not notarized because he was told he needed to come in person from Texas to get this deal done. And the trial court believed that. So what's wrong with the trial court's credibility determination on that issue? It doesn't matter whether the trial court believed it or not because the law, the local resolution says that it must be signed and it just wasn't. And we had testimony. And at the time that he was handed the papers back, he was not told that that was an issue, was he? 
I don't know what he was told. That's not part well, of it. Let's talk about the trial. Was there any evidence that he was told, we are rejecting your application because you haven't had it notarized? Um, I, I think, think the I'll answer to that is I think the answer to that is no. He was not told that at the time he showed up at the clerk's office. It is undisputed that the application was immediately handed back to him. Um, the second part of that was that the two hundred fifty dollars wasn't paid. But one of the issues about that is his duty, his burden at that point in time was not to come to circuit court. It would have been to uh, exhaust administrative remedies and appeal that to the mayor or to city council. There's a whole line of appeal that he should have taken before coming into- Did, you raise, did you raise exhaustion of administrative remedies in this appeal? We, we did, we did in the affirmative defenses at, at the uh, answer. Why are we hearing about this now then? Well, it's kind of wrapped into the sovereign immunity that was absolutely a, uh, uh, raised in the- How does exhaustion of administrative remedies wrap it? I, I'm, I'm just, candidly, Mr. Weiner, I'm having a hard time under, getting my head around the sovereign immunity argument in this context. It sounds to me like you're trying to elevate, you're, you're trying to elevate every single municipal ordinance and requirement to a separation of powers issue. And I just don't think that's the law. I guess the question is, and I put, put this in the brief, uh, on a writ of mandamus or a petition, uh, then it's properly before the court. Not as we have here, which is just this motion to enforce settlement agreement, where the discretion of the city, which the city undoubtedly has under sovereign immunity. I mean, with Haver uh, and the University of Florida case, which make it clear that those discretionary functions this is similar to the issue of issuing a building permit or not issuing a building permit. That's within the sound discretion of the city. And back to this point of the application, it's undisputed that there's no completed application. And what the trial court tells us- And, and, and by the way, Mr. Weiner, that, that line of argument is maybe putting a little too fine a point on it when in fact, the gentleman flew from Texas and submitted an application. It may not have had all the particulars that you all now can that you all contend was required, but that that is also something that's categorically distinct from saying he didn't submit an application, which is what you've said a couple of times now. Yes. So, and that's in the transcript. That's what the POD said. That according to them, he did. So maybe maybe the trial court made the credibility determination that I can't really believe what this general what this witness is telling me when they're telling me things that just are demonstrably incorrect or are so cabined in their meaning that it's just it kind of bends the ability to believe. And how can we, this is really the rub of the issue, why and how are we as an appellate panel uh, supposed to disturb that kind of credibility and fact finding? So let's get to the practical impact of it. It is undisputed that there are uh, approximately 30 liens held by the city of St. Petersburg that are still encumbering this subject property. One of the very real problems that we have here, if this court doesn't reverse this judgment, is that those liens exist, those liens are enforceable, and nothing in any of the documents that are before the court address how we are to treat those. So how, how, is that, how is that our problem today? Wouldn't that be subject to potentially another lawsuit, another dispute, more attorney's fees, more fighting? I mean, I, that's what lawsuits are about, right? But the problem you're, you're asking us to give an advisory opinion. I mean, it sounds like what you're saying right now is what do we do with these other liens? And that sounds to me like you're asking us to give you an advisory opinion or to reverse on a basis that was not before the trial court. The issue before the trial court was multifaceted, but ultimately it was resolved on the basis of a settlement agreement or the court finding the settlement agreement was enforceable. Um. And it's clear to me that those liens exist. I guess I'm not asking for direction on this court. I'm advising the court an undisputed fact that those liens exist and we are still going to have to treat those liens going forward. The problem is the final judgment that is an issue before the court gives sort of conflicting uh, direction as to how the city is to treat these things. Again, back to the concept that the court has found that there is an enforceable settlement agreement. Whatever the terms of that settlement agreement are, is what we're dealing with today. Because if there are liens that might be enforceable or may not be enforceable, that's going to be an issue for another day. Issue is, as the final judgment directs 
the parties to enter into the application number one, application number two, which necessarily includes- No, that's not what the court really does. The court says, you have already agreed on this. Now we're going to go ahead and effectuate it because apparently the court believed that he was prepared to fully effectuate the agreement and the city wrongfully denied him that opportunity when he came out to do so. Yes, but now we're left with the practice. The yes, the yes, but is where I'm having some trouble. It's the but part. You know, I'm I'm struggling a little bit to understand your argument today, as far as uh, as Judge Lucas pointed out, sovereign immunity issues, as far as the enforceability of a judgment where a court made credibility determinations that seems to be supported by the evidence, which I understand the city doesn't like the court's credibility determinations. But that's all we have before us today. Some of these other issues that you're bringing up, you know, sound interesting, but they're not properly before us. So I guess I'll just swing back to the sovereign immunity. Um, I read Haver and I read the University of Florida case and I read Trion as, as directly on point here. And the explicit direction included within those cases, which talk about how in, in Haver, we decline to endorse a judicially a created doctrine of interfering with those planning level uh, legislative or discretionary functions. And there's important- so that, that's, that's absolutely the point on sovereign immunity, planning level type functions, and there's discretion in terms of planning versus operative functions where there may be some discretion, but that discretion isn't covered by sovereign immunity. A wrongful rejection, and, and I'll use this as a hypothetical, a wrongful rejection of paperwork that a resident provides that they're told to provide, that isn't covered by sovereign immunity, at least not under the circumstances of now coming back to this case, of this case. Okay, I, I understand the court's position. Um, uh, I guess the- well, and, I, and, I, and I'll respond that I think we understand your position as well. Thank you. Um, and for the balance, I'll re re rely on the other briefs. Before I uh, clear the clock, uh, are there any other questions from the panel? Or are we fine to go? I'm saying this because there's someone who's not seeing what we're doing, and I want to make sure council knows kind of where we're at. Okay, thank you. I will stop the clock, clear the clock, and we will return then to appellate council for a rebuttal, and you have your five minutes remaining. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh I don't believe I have any rebuttal. I rely on the arguments made in my motion to strike. And Ms. Solar Pazos, I'm going to ask Don, you there one. is a question for you, counsel. I'm going to ask you one question as far as this case is essentially turning on enforceability of a settlement agreement. Is there anything establishing that the settlement agreement had a provision for prevailing party attorney's fees? Your Honor, the settlement agreement the, what the court found was that there was an offer of consideration and acceptance of a settlement to to deal with the case. Um, had the parties or had the city gone through with the settlement agreement, there would be no fees because the, the case had in fact settled. But in this case, the foreclosure claim continued. So the city didn't just stop litigating the initial foreclosure claim. What it did is it continued it and continued to litigate it all the way to trial. And it was at trial that the court found in favor of five of Mr. Jackson's affirmative defenses against the foreclosure claim. So the matter of fees relevant to the settlement I, agreement- So let, let me interrupt. I just wanted to make certain you're not contending there's any provision for fees in the settlement agreement. You're traveling on the request for free for fees that was appended to the counterclaim, if I recall correctly. No, Your Honor. We are alleging that Mr. Jackson is entitled to fees pursuant to statute 162.10 as he prevailed at the on the foreclosure claim by presenting the foreclosure claim. And in your request for, in your pleaded request for fees, was that statute cited? Yes, Your Honor. Where? There's a motion. I, I, I mean, I looked at the I looked at the pleadings themselves, and there was no citation of either contractual or statutory authority 
in the actual pleadings. Is that correct or did I miss something? There was also a memorandum of law that was filed in support of the motion to tax fees and costs. And that was filed how long after the lawsuit was filed? The motion to tax fees and costs was after final judgment. There was two final judgments in this case. There was the initial final judgment and then the amended final judgment, which is what uh, counsel was referring to. Okay, after, I, I, thank you. You've answered my question. Thank you. So the the memorandum in support of the motion to tax fees and costs was filed after the initial final judgment. And that was what was argued at the hearing to tax fees and costs. Thank you. If there's no further questions, um, I have nothing to add. Thank you, counsel. Thank you both for your presentations this morning. That will conclude uh, the oral argument on this matter. And I guess now that you'll be able to, uh, ret to leave this meeting and return to where you'd like to return to, whatever we do electronically, because it's not within my bailiwick. I right, thank you, and we will call the next case.